So now we're on record. Before I begin, I would like to find out if I'm audible enough. <clears throat> so am I loud? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. All right. So mute yourselves. Let's go ahead. Today we are looking at inductive reasoning. We dealt with induct, uh, deductive reasoning last week. And we were saying that for deductive reasoning or that in, uh, deductive reasoning is a relationship. <clears throat> it's a kind of relation, uh, reasoning in which the relationship between the premises and the conclusion is logical. And we're saying that like mathematics, the meanings of the contents do not matter for deductive reasoning. A deductive reasoning can be valid, but the information in the argument is not true. We saw arguments that are valid, but not sound because they're not true. You know, so for deductive reasoning, the, the, the relationship between the premises and the conclusion is just logical, it's mathematical. You just solve it and then just get the validity, whether it is true or not. If you want it to be true, then that's your choice. Uh, so um, it, it's a, 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 a completely logical way of making arguments, deductive reasoning. But for inductive reasoning, the relationship is not logical. That is the relationship between the premises and the conclusion. You know. It is possible to affirm all the premises and deny the conclusion without contradiction for inductive reasoning. You know. So you can affirm the premises and deny the conclusion and then you didn't um, commit any contradiction because the premises are capable of producing more than one conclusion. So in this case, you need to look at the meanings of the contents and then use common sense to decide if the argument is um, it's cogent. Now, so for inductive arguments, the premises provide reason for believing in the likelihood of the conclusion, but the premises don't guarantee the conclusion. So inductive arguments are probability arguments. Last week, we had seen an example of an inductive argument. So we said 95% of uh, students in Legon Hall are, you know, is it are rich or something, are honest. 95% of men are honest. Uh, Peter is a man, therefore Peter is honest. And most of you said the argument is not, uh, you know, it's, it's not a very, it's not a very reliable argument, you know. Because when you say 95% of men are honest and Peter is honest, and then you say Peter is, uh, uh, Peter is a man, therefore Peter is honest, uh, you are not very sure because Peter could be among the 5% of men that are dishonest. You know? So that's the nature of an inductive argument. So inductive arguments provide reason for believing in the likelihood of the conclusion. But the premises do not guarantee the conclusion. Inductive arguments are probability arguments because inductive arguments do not depend on rules. They are harder to evaluate. If it is a deductive argument, it is easy to see that it is correct. But inductive arguments, because they don't depend on rules, they are more difficult to evaluate. Now, since inductive arguments provide, generate more than one possible conclusion, it, it, it's, it's, more, it's more difficult to evaluate inductive arguments because you are faced with more uncertainties.
Now let's begin to make some clarifications. We have the first one, the clarification, the distinction between verifiable and confirmable statements. Verifiable statements are statements we can test directly or verify directly. They are usually factual or empirical statements. Example, Kofi lost trend with age. You can verify that. When he was young, you knew how strong he was. When he became 50, you know how strong he is. But confirmable statements are statements that we cannot test or verify directly. So statements that we cannot directly test or verify except through verifiable statements. Example, all men lose strength with age. You need to appreciate the difference between verifiable and confirmable statements. For verifiable statements, you can verify them directly, but you cannot verify confirmable statements directly. All men lose strength with age, you know. Unless you do that, you can only confirm them by uh, with verifiable statements. Now let's combine them. You have verifiable statements, you have confirmable statements. Verifiable statements are usually premises and confirmable statements are usually conclusions. So look at this. Kofi lost strength with age. Peter lost strength with age. Michael lost strength with age. James lost strength with age. Therefore, all men lose strength with age. The premises are verifiable statements leading to conclusion, a confirmable statement. So that's how it works for most inductive arguments. Another example, Mary reached menopause by 40. Grace reached menopause by 35. Meredith reached menopause by 33. Rose reached menopause by 34. Edith reached menopause by 38. Sophia reached menopause by 45. Therefore, half of all women will reach menopause by 35. So the premises are all verifiable statements. The conclusion is a confirmable statement. Now the conclusion in an inductive argument, the conclusion is usually the, what do you call it? The, the hypothesis. The conclusion is usually regarded as a hypothesis. If you look at this conclusion, you see that technically speaking, it's a hypothesis. The hypothesis that half of all women will lose strength with age. Now, when you formulate a hypothesis in science, you go ahead and test it with experiments. The experiments are, the results of the experiments are the premises. Each premise is a data that you have gathered. Each premise is a data that you have gathered, a piece of data that you have gathered to test or confirm your hypothesis. The hypothesis is serving as a conclusion and then the the premises are pieces of data that you have gathered to test or verify your hypothesis. So in science, you formulate your hypothesis and then you gather data to test your hypothesis, to confirm your hypothesis. So inductive arguments, uh, inductive reasoning is the reasoning that is used in the sciences. You can't use deductive reasoning in sciences because deductive reasoning doesn't depend on science. De deductive reasoning is mathematics, but inductive reasoning is science. Now, two ways of detecting confirmable statements. How do you know that a statement is confirmable statement and that it, it is not verifiable statement? There are two ways to know. First of all, confirmable statements are not directly testable or verifiable. So if you want to know if a statement is confirmable, check if it is verifiable. If it is not verifiable, then it is a good candidate for being a confirmable statement. And then the second one, check if you can convert it into a conditional statement. 
any statement that is a confirmable statement should be convertible into a co uh, conditional statement. Example, look at this category, uh, sorry, look at this categorical statement. No leader steps down from power unless compared by a coup or constitution. So it's a categorical statement. No leader steps down from power unless compared by a coup or constitution. Now you can convert it to a conditional. <clears throat> if X is a leader, then X will not step down unless compared by a coup or constitution. So if a statement is not directly verifiable and you can also convert it into a conditional statement, then such a statement is a confirmable statement. Then let's make another distinction, which we have seen already between the finite and infinite reference classes. The finite reference class is a class of countable items, examples, this copper, that man, some boys, that table, etc. And then the infinite reference class is the class of uncountable, uh, uncountable items, example, all men, all metals, all voters, and so on. So we remember this from our last class. Then we have law-like. Now we made that clarification about the finite and infinite reference classes because of this particular issue here. We have law-like and statistical hypothesis. Law-like hypothesis are confirmable statements that refer to all members of a class, that is infinite reference class. Just a few seconds. Okay. So we have law like hypothesis, confirmable statements that refer to all members of a class. That's the infinite reference class. Example, all metals expand when heated. We, we, we call this a universal statement in our last class because it contains the, it refers to an infinite reference class. So that is also what we call a law-like hypothesis. First of all, it's a hypothesis that all metals expand when heated. You can formulate this kind of hypothesis and then you conduct experiments to try to confirm or disprove it. So it's a hypothesis and it's a universal statement. We're saying that a hypothesis that is a universal statement is called a law-like hypothesis. Confirmable statements that refer to all members of a class. Now look at uh, the conversion to a conditional. If X is a metal, then X will expand when heated. So for category, as a categorical statement, it reads all, metal, uh, all metals expand when heated. And then as a conditional statement, it reads if X is a metal, then X will expand when heated. Now look at another example. All Fs are Gs. Each F is a G. So no Fs are Gs, all Fs are not Gs. So these are all uh, law-like hypotheses because they are universal statements. They are hypotheses that are universal statements. Now, a law-like hypothesis is, a, is highly predictive. Law-like hypotheses are highly predictive. If you say that all members of a class have a particular characteristic. What you are saying is that if at all you identify something in that class, that thing must have that characteristic. So because of that, because all, uh, because law-like hypothesis refer to all members of the class, they are highly predictive because they have already uh, alleged that uh, all the members in a certain class have a certain quality. So there's no way you can identify something in that class and say that it doesn't have that quality. That's why we say that uh, law-like hypotheses are highly predictive. G must be attributed or not attributed to every F. So all men are mortal, Peter is a man, then Peter is mortal. Anything that is a man is very predictably mortal.
On the other hand, we have a statistical hypothesis. These are confirmable statements referring to some percentage less than 100 and more than zero. So these are hypotheses that are particular statements. Example, 90% of those who ate the food fell sick. So statistical hypotheses work with statistical terms such as some, few, many, most, hardly any, typically, and all, the, and all that. So these are the words you see in uh, statistical hypothesis. Now, statistical hypotheses are less predictive. They are less predictive because they don't refer to all members of a class. They just refer to some members of a class. So if you identify something in that class, you are not sure whether it has uh, the characteristics of some members of the class. You know, so for that reason, statistical hypotheses are less predictive. Now you say 90% of those who ate the food fell sick. X ate the food. So does it mean X fell sick? You don't know. Uh, the predictability is lower. If you say 100% of those who ate the food fell sick and you say X ate the food, then we know for, for certain that X fell sick. But if you say 90 or 50% of those who ate the food fell sick and you say, uh, X ate the food, then it means that the chances of X falling sick is just 50-50 uh, or 90-10. You know? So statistical hypotheses are less predictive compared to law-like hypotheses. Now, this is where we see the inferiority of uh, inductive arguments compared to deductive arguments in terms of uh, the certainty of the conclusion. Inductive arguments aim at confirmation, whilst deductive arguments aim at proof. Confirmation is not proof. So evidence confirms but does not prove the truth of a hypothesis. So evidence, evidence, before this class, you must have heard that when evidence proves the truth of something, but that's not so. I'm going to show you why evidence is limited in proving something. Now, evidence confirms, but does not prove the truth of the hypothesis. Now, in order to show you the limitation of evidence, I'll, I'll first of all show you two kinds of inductive arguments. And before we get there, let's look at two major ways to de uh, detect inductive arguments. Now, how do you know an inductive argument? Or how do you know an, in an argument is inductive? First of all, it is capable of more than one conclusion. That's number one. 90% of those who ate the food fell sick, AMA ate the food. So conclusions, you have AMA fell sick, AMA did not fall sick. That's the first way to know an inductive argument. It is capable of more than one conclusion. The second way of detecting an inductive argument is that inductive arguments are extrapolations. We call them extrapolations. An extrapolation is an activity that smuggles in information into the conclusion that was absent in any of the premises. So all inductive arguments all inductive conclusions contain information that is not accounted in the premises. Example, let me show you this. Um, look at this example. Gold expanded when heated, silver expanded when heated, bronze expanded when heated. And then the conclusion is all metals expand when heated. Now you see 10 premises here, telling you that 10 different metals expanded when heated. But the conclusion is that all metals expand when heated. Now, what is the difference between the premises and the conclusion? The difference is that 10 premises are talking about 10 metals, but the conclusion is talking about all metals. Now, all metals are more than 10 metals. So you can't reach conclusion on all metals based on 10 metals. So there's a gap. 
but we'll come back to this. So let's go back to um, what I was saying. So we said all inductive conclusions contain information that is not accounted in premises. Now let's look at the technicality of induction so that we understand why information, how information is smuggled into the conclusion of an inductive argument without the permission of the premises. Now look at the technicality of induction. A known thing A has certain properties such as X, Y, and Z. Another thing B that is not in the premises has the same properties, X, Y, and Z. Now, so both A and B has the same properties, X, Y, and Z. But B is not in any of the premises. B is outside the argument. Now, A also has some additional property Q. So on the basis of the above three premises, the argument concludes, or in reality extrapolates, that B also has the same additional property Q. Now the idea of induction is that if B is like A in some respects, it may also be like A in other respects. So what an inductive argument does is that it says, look, A, A has properties A, B, C. B has properties A, B, C. Now, in addition, A has another property X. So the conclusion is B could also have property X, but there's no proof. The argument is just relying on the fact that A already has three other similar properties. And the argument is saying, okay, because A and B has three similar properties, what, whatever other property A has, B should also have it. But you know that is not, that is not, uh, that, that, that is not a solid argument. It's just an extrapolation. Now let's look at different directions of extrapolation. First of all, you have the part whole extrapolations. Attributing something to a whole that constitutes a part or parts. Now, so you normally has the whole, you, you, you have the whole of something and then you have the parts. Now you say, because some parts of a whole has a quality. Because of that, you say the whole of that thing has the same quality, that quality. Now, so it's an argument that says the whole of something has a quality because uh, one part or some parts have it. So that, that's what we call part whole extrapolations, attributing something to a whole that constitutes a part of parts. We have two types. We have generalizations and we have statistical syllogisms. Let's look at generalization. Peter is strong, James is strong, all men are strong. Peter is strong, James is strong, therefore all men are strong. Now, so this argument says that because Peter is strong and James are strong, all men must be strong. So you are attributing something to all men because you saw it in two men. So that's a part whole generalization. So it, it's a, a particular direction of extrapolation. You are extrapolating from two men to all men. Now you see that there is information in the conclusion that is not in the premises. The two premises are about two men. The conclusion is about all men. So what is the information in the conclusion that is not in the premises? There is, a, there is information that was brought into the conclusion and it is not in the premises. So that information is about all men, all men. And all men can never be two men. Then we have the statistical syllogisms. Most Canadian, this is another part whole generalization. Most Canadian university students drink alcohol. Caroline is a Canadian university student, therefore Caroline drinks alcohol. 
So you see that this argument is not very, is not valid, is not very solid. Something is missing. If most Canadian university students drink alcohol, it means that it is not all of them that drink alcohol. So saying that Caroline is a, a Canadian university student does not really prove that she drinks alcohol. So it's another part whole generalization. In this case, you are coming down from the general to the particular. Then we have what we call analogies. This is another kind of extrapolation or another direction of extra, uh, extrapolation. Arguing that something possesses the same thing as another because they both possess some other properties. When you argue that something possesses the same property as another because both of them possess some other properties. Example, the structural adjustment program was good for Cameroon, which is a third world country. The structural adjustment program was good for Uganda, which is a, a, a third world country. The structural adjustment program was good for Senegal, which is a third world country. The structural adjustment program was good for Nigeria, which is a third world country. Therefore, the structural adjustment program must be good for Togo, which is a third world country. So this is an argument by analogy, an argument by analogy. You attribute something that is in something to another thing because both of them have another common property. Now, what is the common property that is possessed by all these countries, including the country in the conclusion? The country that is in the conclusion is Togo. What does Togo share with all the countries in the premises? Or what can you say is common between Togo and all the countries in the premises? They are third world countries. They are third world countries. So because yes. they are third world countries, you now say that a program that work, worked in uh, how many? One, let me see, one, two, one, two, three, four. So because they are third, third world countries, you say a program that worked well in four third world countries must also work well in Togo. So you attribute, you attribute a property you see in something to another thing because you notice that both of them have another common property. So that's an analogy. Using a common property to attribute another property to something you know, across um, items. So you can see that the argument is not solid because being third, third world countries doesn't mean that anything that worked in one of them must work in the others. You know, there are other complexities in each country apart from being a third world country. Then we have predictions. Attributing a quality to a future event because of the level of frequency of past occurrences of the same quality and similar events. So Tyson has won his last 30 boxing fights. Therefore, Tyson will win his next boxing fight. So because Tyson won his last 30 boxing fights, he must, he will win his next boxing fight. So something is missing in this argument. It's not, you can see that there's an extrapolation. There's an extrapolation from the past to the future. But the future cannot exactly be like the past. That's the problem. Anything that can happen in the future that doesn't really respect the past. So any inductive argument you see, you will find information in the conclusion that is not accounted for in the premises. It is like stealing in a piece of information into the conclusion without the permission of the premises. And then we have two kinds of uh, inductive arguments. 
or you call them enumerative inductive arguments based on trend. So we have two kinds of inductive arguments based on their, their, cap their capability or their strength. Now, enumerative argument means an argument with many premises. That is, you enumerate the premises like a list. You know. It's just like this population census that is going on right now. People are going from house to house, taking down the names of people and all that. What they are doing is called enumeration. You know. So by now, some of you must have been enumerated by the uh, census officials. So an enumerative argument is an argument with many premises. Now, so the first kind of argument, we want to distinguish two kinds of arguments. The first one is an argument with law-like hypothesis as conclusion. And then the second one is the argument with statistical hypothesis as conclusion. Remember, we, we distinguish between law-like and statistical hypothesis. So the arguments where they are conclusions, where they serve as conclusions are the two kinds of inductive arguments. So you have inductive arguments with law-like hypothesis as conclusion. And then you have inductive arguments with statistical hypothesis as conclusion. First of all, let us look at inductive arguments with law-like hypothesis as conclusion. This is an example. You have 10 premises. Gold expanded when heated. Silver expanded when heated. Bronze expanded when heated and so on. So 10 different metals expanded when heated. And then the summary premise is that all the metals tested so far expanded when heated. So the summary premise is telling you that 10 metals expanded when heated. But the conclusion is that all metals expand when heated. Remember I told you before that all men is different from all the men. When I was telling you that all the men and all men are not the same, I told you that all the men could mean all the men in this class, all the men in this community, all the men in this town, all the men in this country, they are countable. But when you talk about all men, all men is not countable. So there's a difference between all the men and all men. In this argument, you see a difference. You see the same difference. You have all the metals, all the metals tested. And then you have all metals. Both of them are not the same at all. All metals, you can never completely know about all metals. We've seen, we've discovered some metals and we are probably yet to discover other metals. So all metals, it is impossible to capture all metals. But when you talk about all the metals, you are talking about all the metals that we have experienced, all the metals we have discovered. That's the difference between the two. So now this argument is saying that based on an experiment done with 10 metals, you are reaching a conclusion about all metals. So there is a jump. There's a jump from 10 metals to all metals. Now that jump is a fallacious jump. It is a jump that is not logical. Because it amounts to reaching a general conclusion from particular discoveries. So you can never really be sure that the conclusion is correct because tomorrow you could find a metal that doesn't expand when heated. And in fact, we would find out that such metals were discovered. So premises one to 10 are verifiable or particular statements. And even the summary premise is a summation of all the verifiable premises. But the conclusion is a confirmable or general statement. Now the argument is strictly invalid because it amounts to jumping from verifiable to confirmable statements. So that's the reason why confirmation is not proof and inductive arguments are not valid. Now, so in fact, the conclusion is false because some metals in fact expand when heated.
Let me see. Okay, so some metals don't expand when heated. So this, this is uh, a typo, a typographic error. So some metals, in fact, do not expand when heated. We call them superconductors. They don't absorb heat, so they don't expand. So the conclusion is false because, sorry, I'm coming. The conclusion is false because there are exceptions. Okay, so I just made the correction. So the conclusion is false. So metals, in fact, do not expand when heated. They are called superconductors. They do not absorb heat, so they, they do not expand. So the conclusion is false and all the premises are true. So this is the scenario. All the premises are true, but the conclusion is false. So that's why we say that in inductive argument, for an inductive argument, all the premises could be true and the conclusion could be false. It is only an inductive argument that you can find that possibility where the relationship between the premises and the conclusion is not logical. The premises can be true and the conclusion could be false. And then the argument is not contradictory. Remember we said that 95% of men are honest. Peter is honest. Peter is a man, therefore Peter is honest. And we were saying that there are two conclusions, two possible conclusions. We said conclusion one, Peter is honest. Conclusion two, Peter is not honest. And we're saying that any of those conclusions can be the conclusion and then there's nothing wrong with the argument. The argument can go with Peter is honest. The argument can go with Peter is not honest. Any of those conclusions that the argument goes with, the argument is fine. So that's the nature of an inductive argument. It is possible to deny the conclusion with all true premises or affirm premises and deny conclusion. So this is applicable to all the types of extrapolation, both the path hole, the analogies and the predictions. You can say Tyson won all his last 30 boxing fights, but Tyson will lose his next fight. The argument is acceptable. Accuracy versus providing information. So, we are finished looking at the technicality of inductive arguments. Now let's make some, some evaluative remarks about inductive arguments and compare them to deductive arguments. Now deductive arguments are accurate at the expense of the inability to provide information. So looking at, looking at the comparison between deductive and inductive arguments, already you know that deductive arguments are accurate, but inductive arguments are not, are not as accurate as deductive arguments. But there's a particular problem with deductive arguments. That problem is that deductive arguments are accurate at the expense of the inability to provide information. So deductive arguments are accurate, but they don't provide new information. Now let's look at this example. Either it is raining or it is not raining. This is a disjunctive syllogism. Either it is raining or it is not raining. Now this sentence, you can't say it, it is wrong. This sentence can never be wrong. It can never be wrong because right now it might be raining, right now it might not be raining. So whether it is actually raining or not, this sentence will always be correct. So inductive arguments are always correct, but it doesn't provide information about whether it is actually raining. It doesn't tell you that it is raining. It doesn't tell you that it is not raining. So it doesn't provide any information. It just states a condition that must be true in all cases, but it is not giving you any information that will help you right now about, about the climate, or about the weather. So that's the problem with deductive arguments. Deductive arguments are accurate, but they don't provide new information. They don't provide information. Okay, look at statement two. If it is raining, then someone will get wet. 
if it is raining, then someone will get wet. What do we call this one? We call this um, conditional statement. If it is raining, then someone will get wet. So this statement does not say whether it is raining. It doesn't tell you whether it is raining or not. It just tells you, it just states a condition that if it is raining, someone will get wet. You know, you can't say this statement is wrong because you know that if it rains, someone will get wet. Everyone cannot succeed in being inside when it is raining. So people must get wet. So the statement is always correct in every situation, but does it tell you whether it is raining? No. So inductive, yeah, deductive arguments are accurate at the expense of providing information. But on the other hand, inductive arguments provide information at the expense of accuracy. So you see that the disadvantage of one is the advantage of the other. Inductive arguments provide information at the expense of accuracy. Now, any information that is provided by inductive argument is falsifiable. Example, it is raining right now. It is raining right now is an empirical statement. You know, it can be the conclusion of an inductive argument. Any valuable information, any valuable empirical information must be falsifiable. So when an information is empirical. Let, let's look at this example. It is raining right now. Any information that is empirical is, we call it, it is falsifiable. That is, you, you, it is capable of being true or false. Now, it is raining right now. It's capable of being true. It's capable of being false. Alvin Do, you need to put off your mic. Okay, so any information that's empirical is falsifiable. It is raining right now can be false. In fact, as I'm speaking right now, the statement it is raining right now is false because it is not raining around my home. So the statement is false for me right now. It can also be false for you if right now it is not raining at your home or wherever you are. But the statements we saw before this, the statements one and two that we saw before this, they are not falsifiable. Either it is raining or it is not raining. It's not falsifiable. If it is raining, someone will get wet. It is not falsifiable. But it is raining right now, it's falsifiable because it's an empirical information. It is giving you, it is providing you information. The other two statements are not falsifiable because they, are, they don't provide any information. This one is falsifiable because it is providing information. So any statement that provides information is falsifiable. Any empirical statement is a falsifiable statement. Any statement that is not falsifiable cannot be a verifiable or confirmable statement. Any statement that is not falsifiable cannot be a verifiable or confirmable statement. Any statement that is absolutely true has no empirical content. Any statement that is absolutely true has no empirical content. So by now you begin to see the balance, the more accurate, the less information. The less accurate, the more information. So each side of the deal has advantages and disadvantages. So more valuable but more falsifiable. The empirical statement, it rains every third Friday of the month is more valuable information than it rained just now. Now, if we're talking about the value of a piece of information, then the statement it rains every third Friday of the month is more valuable than the statement it rained just now. If you get, if you have information that it rained just now, it wouldn't help you as much as knowing that it rains every third Friday. If you have information that it rains every, fri every third Friday, 
you will be able to arrange all your activities every third Friday so that the rain will not affect you. So that means that the statement it rains every third Friday of the month is more valuable than the information that it rains just now. The more valuable, the more falsifiable. So the more valuable an information is, the more falsifiable it also is. So it will take only just one third Friday of not raining to falsify the, the, the statement. So if we are in a particular third Friday and it doesn't rain, then that has falsified the statement completely. Now let's look at the second type of inductive argument. We just finished with um, inductive arguments with law-like hypothesis as conclusions. Now we want to look at inductive arguments with statistical, uh, statistical hypothesis as conclusion. This is an example. Michael was vaccinated for polio and never suffered polio. That's premise one. Premise two, Gilbert was vaccinated for polio and suffered polio. So Michael didn't suffer after vaccination. Gilbert suffered after vaccination. Then premise three, Mary was vaccinated and never suffered. Premise four, Stanley was vaccinated and never suffered. Premise five, James was vaccinated and never suffered. Six, Bob was vaccinated and suffered it. G was vaccinated and never suffered. Samuel was vaccinated and never suffered. John went through it and never suffered. Carol was vaccinated and never suffered. So the summary premise, eight out of 10 people who were vaccinated for polio did not suffer polio. So eight people who were vaccinated didn't suffer. Two who were vaccinated still suffered it. So the conclusion is that polio vaccination has 80% potential of preventing polio. So eight out of 10 people, that's 80%. The conclusion is that polio vaccination has 80% potential of preventing polio. So like I told you, uh, inductive arguments are the kind of arguments used in the sciences. The conclusions of inductive arguments are normally hypotheses that you subject to experiments. So, or rather, they, they can be the result of experiments. So premises one to 10 are the results of experiments or uh, an activity that has taken place. And then you've get, gathered the data. The data in the, is in the form of 10 premises. And then you, you construct the conclusion based on the premises. So this is a, a statistical, the conclusion is a statistical hypothesis because it's talking about 80%. You know, so you, you see that the statistical hypothesis are better than the law-like hypothesis because the law-like hypothesis that is talking about all metals expand when heated, you know, it's not a very wise kind of hypothesis. The, the, the better ones, what scientists mostly use are the statistical hypothesis so that you can at least be sure of what you are saying, you know. So it is better to say that 80% of those who were vaccinated suffered something than to say that all metals expand when heated, you know. So the summary on the two types of inductive arguments, you have the ones ending with law-like hypothesis as conclusions, and then you have the ones ending with statistical hypothesis as conclusions. Now, hypotheses are technically regarded as conclusions of inductive arguments, just, have, just like I have explained uh, already because they are confirmable statements to be supported or confirmed or denied by verifiable statements. So now we, we can take questions and remember to read your textbooks. For next class, we'll be doing causal reasoning. So today was inductive reasoning. Next class is causal reasoning. Causal reasoning is a kind of inductive reasoning, but we'll see how, how, it, uh, how it works. Any questions before we round up?
Okay, so if there are no questions, I'm going to upload this video right now. All those who didn't attend, please tell them to watch the video. And um, by, this is Wednesday. So by Friday morning, by Friday morning, by this time, we should be discussing um, uh, causal reasoning. Okay, sir. All right. Okay, sir. sir. Thank you very okay. much. Okay, sir. All right, so take care of yourselves. I'll see yeah. you. Hello, sir. Sir, we love you. Yeah, I love you too. Yeah, I jump on. Sir, we love you. Uh, sir, please, I want to know when we write our um, I. Don't worry about the I. I just gave you an assignment. Have you written that? No, I'm here to write that. So write that before you the IA comes. Or maybe that's the one you are referring okay, to. Okay. Check Thank it. Well. I, I'm not sure if it's still okay. there, but check it. If you don't find it, then send me an email. Say. Yeah, Clement. Hello, sir. Yes? Sir, please, after the submission, I didn't see any greeting or something, my Sakai. Yeah, but I sent a message. Do you read your WhatsApp messages? I, the TA must have sent you. Your TA must have sent you a message on that. Okay, I just, I just, I just. Missed. Yeah. So the message, the message is that it is manually graded. It is manually. Oh, okay. Graded. The TA is going to grade it. Uh, she has not started. So until she grades it, it to remain zero. Oh, okay. okay. Right. So Jacqueline, Thank Jacqueline, you. you wanted to say something. Um, step please. The assignment what does it cover is it everything we've done so far yeah everything we've done so far although it's just a part we have three assignments so the this first one it covered just the early part of what we did the second one will cover something later and then the third one it will probably cover uh, the, the length and the breadth you know so just be ready you have to be prepared on all we've done so that you can uh, deal with each of them very well thank you yeah, Mary, 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 you have a question. Sir, please, is it multiple choice question or we are writing it? Yeah, it's essay. It's essay. They, they are some, some assignments will be multiple choice. So I think the one I just gave is essay. All right, and then Matilda. I don't know whether Matilda wanted to ask because her microphone was on so all right so just um, take care of yourselves uh, remain healthy and keep working hard uh, all of you are going to be great goodbye goodbye god bless you